Inflation is the world's biggest worry, according to an Ipsos survey carried out across 27 countries. Worry about inflation has risen for 11 straight months and is joined by other economic concerns at the top of the latest What Worries the World survey. We can't say we're surprised. If anything, we are relieved that people are finally waking up to the fact that the state of the global economy is so bad. But what happens next? How long until central bankers realise that there's not just one type of inflation going on here? This and more is what I spoke to this week's guest about. Dr. Mark Faber of the Gloom, Boom and Doom Report joins us to talk about inflation and the rock and the hard place that central bankers find themselves in, all thanks to their own actions, I might add. We also discuss the motives of central bankers and the proverbial storm they find themselves in. Where will things go in the war against Putin? And for how long can the US keep pretending that they're the America that the world loved 50 years ago? If you enjoy this interview, be sure to share it, to tweet it, and to hit the like button. And if you haven't already, why not subscribe to Goldcore TV? We have a brilliant new show just launched, the M3 Report. It's only two episodes old, and it features bonus material from today's guest, Mark Faber, and some fresh insights from our own team, as well as some technical analysis from Garrett Soloway. Look out for our new feature, Trading Places, with Jim Rickards, Michael Pento, and Danielle DiMartino Booth, to name a few. But for now... Enjoy the full interview with Mark Faber, who I'm delighted to welcome back to Goldcore TV. Mark Faber, welcome back to Goldcore TV. Well, thank you very much for having me on your program. It's great to have you. Now, there's a question that I saw on Twitter this week, and it really kind of piqued my interest, and I want to pose it to you. Uh, When something like this, it says the Fed are facing two options. Option A is keep raising rates, sell bonds, and allow the Great Depression 2.0 and 30% unemployment. Option B is quantitative easing to infinity, 0% rates, allow inflation to run hot at 20% plus with stagflation and destroying the US dollar. My question is this, are there any other options? Which one of those is worse and which one will they choose? Well, we don't know what they will choose, but whatever the government does is usually a bad choice. (laughs) They should leave most of the economic matters to free markets to individual decisions and to the capitalistic uh, uh, system, to what we, ha- what we had to make essentially the Western society prosperous over the last 200 years. Now, over the last 100 years, we had the shrinkage of the private sector and an expansion of the government sector. And as this expansion of the government sector lasted, and became more and more uh, interventionist, uh, the economic growth obviously slowed down. So if you look at Britain between 1800 and 1900, or the US between 1800 and 1900, it was a much stronger Mm. uh, economic growth in terms of personal uh, income gains in real terms. Whereas in uh, the last century, the 20th century, economic growth has slowed down. And over the last 40 years, for most people, I'm saying most people, there has been no progress in economic prosperity in the standards of living of individuals. And that is essentially the interventions of government officials, most of which uh, pursue their personal interest and not this good, uh, not what is good for society. And uh, regarding your question, what is good for, what is the least uh, bad option for the Fed to proceed from here on? I'd say the best option would be to close down the Fed, to <laughs> abandon the Fed that all these people that we have at the Fed for the last 30, 40 years are money printers and nothing else, interventionists uh, with a lack of knowledge of history and of social sciences. And they all, the last three Fed chairmen, 
they all subscribed to Milton Friedman's theories, but they took it out of the context of Milton Friedman, who always argued for small government, for non-intervention, and actually argued that a computer would do a better job than the Fed officials that print at the wrong time and tighten at the wrong time and actually make uh, matters much worse. So having said that, I think the worst possible option today for the US would be to print money. By tightening the screws, it is far from certain that uh, unemployment would so soar to 30%. We will have a recession, but the recession is overdue anyway. It would have happened in 2019, 2020, but then they flushed the system with a huge liquidity bubble that prolonged the artificial expansion of the US, but also led to higher debts and to higher inflation rates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Milton Friedman was very clear about this that government spending that is financed by an expansion in the quantity of money is inflationary. And they all read Milton Friedman. Bernanke, he had a speech when uh, Milton Friedman turned 90 and said, oh, uh, we will not let another depression occur. But Anna Schwartz, or Schwartz, who wrote the his monetary history of the United States with Milton Friedman. She then criticized Bernanke. She was right. So if they're all familiar with Friedman, they've all studied Friedman, and they're all, they all understand that effectively the policies <laughs> that, um, that they have pursued over the last number of years were bound to lead to inflation. The whole narrative that we've seen over the last while of transitory inflation as they've continued to print money for the last decade plus has all been a bit kind of nonsense then, hasn't it? They've, they've thoroughly no, understood. No, it's not nonsense. It is a blatant lie. Right, okay. This is okay. what they are, liars. Intellectually, completely dishonest characters. Okay. Including Madame Lagarde. So she all should of... be actually in jail for corruption. But as you know, the French legal system and politics is a little bit different than what your morality and my morality would demand. But what they are telling the public is completely wrong. But one of the reasons they were so wrong is uh, we have today a system where academics are always invoked. And so the academics uh, are paid by the government frequently because they're on this commission and that commission. And in the economic sphere, academics are frequently consultants to the feds. So they will never say anything against the fed and the portfolio managers. And this has to be spelled out very clearly. The portfolio managers have always applauded money printing and bailouts mm -hmm. because the fees of a fund manager depend on rising stocks. The large, the higher the stock market goes, the larger his fees are. And so the fund management industry and the academics who have been bribed essentially by the government and by the Fed. The Fed is the government. Mm -hmm. They finance the government. It's the branch number four of the government. They always applauded money printing. Now, of course, the government goes after each other. And, and so Biden, he blames the Fed or no. He blames number one is Putin. <laughs> <laughs> Putin should be actually, they should make a monument for him because he's absorbing all the blame for everything that goes wrong. So we're in a situation there where 
blatant liars is what you've called the central bankers and the and the Correct. policy makers. We can't trust the, a lot of the time, we can't trust the academics either because they're in the pocket of the Fed uh, and they're being Correct. paid by the Fed. And they're, as a result, they are, their, 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 their citations are noted, their, their, um, their view on what's going on is very much in keeping what, what the Fed is and the narrative that the Fed is pushing. Yeah. You've got the fund managers then that are applauding the Fed for this um, yeah. because they make bigger fees as, as stocks continue <laughs> to go yeah. up. Um, what's going to stop them? Well, in my view, nothing, because as you know, in the Western world, we have so-called democracies and the voters, uh, they vote essentially for an expansion of the government and more and more handouts. Uh, if you are a politician and you're a decent and honest man and tell the public, look, uh, the situation is not very favorable. Uh, the only way we can get back the country on a steady course of freedom and democracy and economic liberties the only cause is to essentially reduce the role of the government, have less regulation, but everybody has to tighten his belt. Mm -hmm. And belt tightening, go try to go to retirees and tell them your pension will be 10% lower. There's no way they will vote for you. Yes. So are we, are we finding ourselves in a, a no-win situation then? In my view, we have postponed uh, economic corrections for far too long. We had the opportunity to clean the system in 2007, 2009, in the great financial crisis. But they immediately said, well, we, if we don't bail out this and don't bail out that and don't print money, we'll have a depression. I don't think it would have been a depression. It would have been a serious recession. But in adversity, people learn. If you keep on bailing out people, uh, you reward essentially zombie companies that should go out of business. And you penalize the conservative, prudent businessman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you said that we've missed the opportunities to kind of clean out the system, to wash it out. Um, well, I think it will be worse this time around. Well, that was that was going to be my question, because each time that you do that uh, and each time you print more money, effectively, the clean out is going to be longer and deeper, more severe, more painful for all. In my view, yes. Uh, add to this the faulty intervention in the case of COVID, mm -hmm. which may have been man-made, not by the Chinese, but by some other interest groups. Mm -hmm. And uh, a completely, and I have to stress this, a completely uh, preventable war with Russia. This has been planned by the Americans or so-called NATO. I mean, the British are basically another state of America. Mm. They will do what the American president tells Boris to do, because Boris, he depends on the Americans to keep him in power. Um, and you say uh, avoidable, avoidable war. So ultimately, what do you see as being the motivation for perpetuating this war? In America, you have some people in the State Department, for whatever reason, they hate Putin. And it, it's 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 that simple. Putin, they want Putin out of, well, out of, it's out of power. Or there are many uh, reasons, you know. There's a lot of corruption money that has flown through Ukraine, as we well know. Mm. But the media doesn't discuss the Hunter Biden computer and what is on the computer and the relationship of the Biden family to, uh, I think the company was called Bukima mm -hmm. in Ukraine and how much money they paid and so forth and so on. 
Right. Okay. So this is. Um, I this... was actually just watching before we were talking <coughs> the impeachment uh, debate, the beginning, where three constitutional lawyers maintained that there is reason to impeach uh, President Trump. Mm -hmm. One, he hedged himself, he said, based on the evidence that I have seen. Well, the evidence that was provided wasn't sufficient, in my opinion. But we don't want to talk about this. But all the arguments they used in that discussion, why President Trump should be impeached, you could use, you could have used about the Clintons mm -hmm. doing things for personal gains. And you could use them for Mr. Biden, Joe Biden. Okay. Exactly so there's a... the same arguments. Right. Okay. If I bring you back to this question, then we talk about either the, the choices of the Fed, raising rates, uh, continuing to raise rates, uh, and creating the Great Depression 2.0. You said that, that, that if they do that, they may not actually create a, a, a depression. Uh, am I correct? In it will into? be a severe recession, no question. Yeah but it may be the better outcome than to print money. Mm. But, with the, but with, their track, with their track record, uh, they have tended to always go for money printing. So is, is, is that the most likely outcome that we're going to see? I think so, because I think some, I think the likelihood of war is actually quite high. A, a bigger war than what we're seeing at the moment. An escalation. Mm. Uh, and do you, you see that escalation on the continent of Europe, or do you see it? Uh, do, you, do you see hotspots elsewhere? Well, when Mr. Biden tells uh, the world that uh, this Ukraine conflict has solidified uh, NATO and so forth, uh, that is questionable. That mm -hmm. statement, because some NATO countries are not entirely on board. And some have different views than the US, but uh, maybe what he says has some grain of truth. But equally, close to 90% of the world hasn't sanctioned Russia. They are actually very careful to adopt the Western Alliance view the, by Western alliance, I mean principally the US, Great Britain, Canada, Australia. These are the Western leaders that then essentially uh, use Europe to enlarge the conflict. But 80, 90% of the world's population is not on board. Mm -hmm. No. And I think uh, whatever the crisis, whatever way the crisis will end, I can guarantee you that the American prestige, I grew up in the 50s. We admired America in the 50s, even in the 60s. In the 70s, some question marks arose because of the Vietnam War. Nowadays, I think most of the world has a low opinion of America. Okay, so the, you, you do see that the potential is increasing for an escalation uh, of of, uh, of this war. Uh, just back to the question: Do you think that there's an escalation of war in the continent of Europe, or do you think then that uh, th that there are potential for hotspots elsewhere, as in uh, potentially tension between the U.S. and China over Taiwan? Well, I think the tensions between the U.S. and China are not about Taiwan. No. They're not about Taiwan. Now, Taiwan can be made an issue, but the issue for the last 10, 15 years in America, among the so-called neocons, who are all of them warmongers, they went to war in Iraq, and they claimed that uh, Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction which is another lie that they prop, uh, that they uh, adopted and told the world. Mm -hmm. 
including the recently deceased Colin Powell, who was Secretary of State at the, ta at the time. And the UN inspector, he had maintained and uh, had an uh, investigation, he had found no indication of weapons of mass destruction, none. Hmm. They wanted war, they wanted war in uh, Libya, they went to war. The Americans, they will go to war with anyone who doesn't subscribe to their views, democratic views, and uh, LGBTQ <laughs> minorities and so forth and so on. And, uh, you know, this is not the way to approach uh, the world when you're no longer the unique superpower. And that's a that's a that's a bit of a theme at the moment, anyway, isn't it? In in terms of this, um, uh, we've had a fairly unipolar world for a long time, where we've had that U.S. dominance, uh, and that is shifting now, and it's shifting probably yeah, at a greater rate. But some people, you, you understand that the State Department, and you can check who they are. I mean, it's quite obvious visually already. Uh, they don't want to acknowledge that. And they think that by dropping bombs and drones and whatever it is, they can kind of gain, regain their power. It's not going to happen. Mm. Do you think um, one of the biggest developments that we've seen uh, <laughs> this year around the war is the idea of weaponizing financial assets? Do you see that as a huge mistake by the um, by the U.S. in particular? Um, one of the reasons that I ask that question is because uh, you've got the likes of China, uh, who are massive holders of of U.S. treasuries, uh, and they've seen what China yeah. they've seen what the U.S. has done to um, to Russia's uh, or attempted to do to Russia's uh, dollar assets. Um, and as a result of that, they're maybe looking long and hard at their own balance sheets and saying, we don't necessarily want to be holding the same amount of U.S. Uh, denominated assets as we have in the past. Um, and as a result of that, kind of ushering in uh, this era uh, that may see or that will see an end potentially to U.S. financial dominance. Does that... Does that sit with you? Well, I think uh, the reserve currency status of the US dollar, regardless, is going to come to an end. Because there's much more trade between, say, uh, China, Europe, China, the rest of the world, Africa, Latin America, then between China and the US. This is a much more trade between Africa and India and Africa and Russia and so forth than towards the US. Mm. You understand? Yes. The role of the US dollar is going to diminish. And in my opinion, the seizure of assets from Russia is one of the dumbest policy decisions you could imagine. First of all, but the Europeans don't see it that way. The Europeans think, oh, we go with America is a great thing to do. Actually, ordinary Europeans don't think that way. But the politicians, because the politicians get paid also left, right and center by all kinds of charitable institutions, mm. <laughs> believe me. And uh, but uh, the individual in Europe, he says, I'm a farmer in England, I'm a workman, I'm a carpenter, I'm a plumber. What do I care about the Eastern territory of Ukraine? It's none of my business. I care about my cost of living. Mm -hmm. I want to have access to food and to energy at reasonable costs. Well, that's something that's... <laughs> significant a significant problem at this stage um, yeah, of course it is a problem 
but the politicians, they couldn't care less about the people. This is why I am uh, very, from the time I grew up to up to now, I have lost every uh, idea that democracy is a good system. Mm. Well, you called them earlier. We, you... we have no longer true, we no longer have a government that represents the people. We have a government that represents their own personal interest and their own emotions. They hate someone else because he had a different view and so forth. And the same in academics, you have a university. At a university, you should be happy to have different views. But no, the professors, if another professor has a different view, they kick him out. They la label him as a racist. He gets cancelled. They get cancelled. So you cannot have educational, uh, educational institutions that operate that way. You brainwash the public. You're not painting. Um... You're not painting a very rosy picture at all. So we've got a situation no, where, where I tell you, I, I mean, I have large assets, and uh, because I was in the financial field starting 1970, but I am convinced that we are in a period that will see negative changes occur, where you will have to say, okay, if I lose 20%, I'm a genius because lots of people will lose 100%. Mm. All the meme stock investors, we talked last uh, December, I think, I told you at that time, the meme stocks and the fund who were in a bubble in November, December 2021, the meme stocks, they peaked out like ARC Innovation Fund. This was the most popular fund run by a lady who is perfectly okay. She's not a vicious, uh, she's not a dishonest person, except her intellectual dishonesty is uh, was brought out in the sense that she always told people, oh, my fund will go up 30% in the next uh, five years annually. These statements are not allowed under the SEC rules to make these kind of statements, but she got away with it. So the SEC is not to protect individual investors, it's to protect the fund managers. So nobody's, nobody's doing their job, basically, at this In stage. In government, nobody's doing his job. And the ones that are doing the job, they're kicked out or not promoted. And even the fund managers aren't doing their jobs properly. Well, you see the, in the problem in, in, is, like with Like with what you're saying with Kathy Woods I, there. I want to explain to you what the problem is. Mm. You're a fund manager. And we had in Britain several examples already in 99, 2000. There were people that were out of the market and uh, were bearish about the market and so forth. Uh, they were kicked out because the client said, oh, he's lost it. The, the clients pushed him to do imprudent things. Mm -hmm. That is another problem. It's, a, it's human nature, though, isn't it? It's, it's greed. Uh, you, you've got, you'll have one fund manager, if you get the Kathy, Kathy Woods example there, uh, saying we'll do 30% uh, for the next couple of years. You know, and then you've got another fund manager saying, "I, you know, I, I think we're going to struggle over the next couple of years to to yeah. to make money I mean, to make money with a single with a single strategy fund." Um, you know, that the, there's that human nature, that greed. It's the type of greed that goes after the mean but, stocks. And but I want to point out to you that greed is, of course, increased and magnified in an environment where money is being printed and Brilliant. hand it out for free. You understand? Mm. And nobody spends money very uh, generously and imprudently who has worked for his money. Yes. The people who get money for nothing, they'll do it. Yeah. Easy, easy money creates a greater risk appetite, yeah. really, isn't that it? Um, and so... 
as I say, you don't paint a rosy picture, but we do have to try and navigate these financial markets over the next couple of years. Uh, yes, and, uh, correct. How, how do we do that carefully? <laughs> well, you know, someone could argue, well, if you're so negative about financial markets, I sell everything and go into cash. Mm -hmm. But then I respond to that, well, the government told you to stay home, locked you in. If you had a house and you went out of your house to have a smoke, they came and arrested you <laughs> because you were not supposed to go out. If they can do that and mandate vaccines and tell government employees, either you take the vaccine or we kick you out, they can come and do what they did in Cyprus. They can say all the deposits in the banking system are canceled and everyone keeps a hundred thousand dollars. That's it. So, so in the guy who has everything in cash, he may lose the most. Yes. And finally the just Russian oligarchs that had their yachts uh, and assets in Dubai, they were okay. But if they had it in the UK, they were not okay, or in Germany. And just before we wrap up, uh, can you remind us, uh, remind our, our, our watchers here, um, how they can learn more about what it is that you do? <laughs> well, I'm still learning. So, <laughs> I, well, I'm a financial advisor. I have a PhD in economics. I went to the London School of Economics, uh, among others, and I wrote a thesis on the financial reform of Robert Peel, your prime minister, in 1842, that repealed the Corn Laws and the Navigation Acts under the influence of Richard Cobden, the mm. free trade advocate. And since then, I've been uh, in the financial markets. I worked in New York and then starting in 1973, uh, I lived in Hong Kong and covered Asia. And I was then I opened the offices of Drexel Burnham Lambert. And starting 1990, I had my own business. And I write uh, two newsletters every month, the gloom, boom and doom report, and then a market commentary. And uh, the information is on my website, gloomboomdoom.com. Gloom, boom, doom, all in one word. Or if they look me up, Mark Faber. <laughs> Perfect. But I'm not in the promotional business. You understand? Indeed. I have my subscribers and I have my business interests and so forth. Uh, but I'm happy to share my views. But I think that instead of always thinking how much money will I make, people should uh, rethink and uh, consider what is the best way to stay alive and financially relatively wealthy. Say, if everything drops by 50% and you're down by 10% or 20%, you're a genius. Indeed. Indeed. You will win a prize. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the website in the description and the show notes below this video. So anybody that oh, wants to, anybody wants to subscribe, click on that, and I'd highly recommend thank doing you very that. Much. You're very, you're thank very, you. you're very, you're very welcome. And uh, I'd be absolutely delighted if we can catch up with you again in a couple of months' time. Uh, yes, and sure. See, see if, see if you're in any more optimistic at that stage. Well, you know, you asked me a question at the beginning about tightening and about printing money. If they print money, assets can go up, but maybe not in real terms. Indeed. You, you understand the stock yes. market could go ballistic up, the gold could go up even more, uh, bitcoins could go up, and the standards of living under any scenario I'm quite sure will go down mm. with the policies that the politicians pursue. And I have to stress once again, 
I was thinking just now, because I've read quite carefully history, and of course, history is so large, it's very difficult to know everything. But I have to say, when I look at the Biden administration, at the administration in Germany, even in Britain, I, and Trudeau in Canada, I mean, what a complete joke these people are. Hmm. It's, all, it's all fake, it's so realist. I mean, it's hard to believe that a more incompetent group of people could be taking these major decisions. And just you see, look at the energy policies of Mr. Biden. Indeed. That just recently goes and blames the people at the pump that the price is high, they should lower the price. Why are they high? Because he pursued energy policies, turning off the leases on uh, federal land. And at the day one, he came into office, he immediately stopped the Keystone Pipeline. Mm -hmm. So you see it as, you see it as incompetence? There many philosophers, they say most countries go bankrupt and into demise and decay, not because of foreign enemies, because of inside uh, the tendency to commit suicide. Indeed, indeed. Once again, thank you for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I highly recommend anybody, uh, everybody, sure. to click on I'm that not link. Not sure my views are a pleasure, <laughs> but it's better to be realistic. Indeed. Well, it's a pleasure to get an opportunity to to pick your brains. It's 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 been definitely been a pleasure for me. But for now, Mark Faber, thanks for joining us again on Gold Core well, TV. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye bye. My thanks to Mark Faber for joining us once again on Goldcore TV, and we look forward to welcoming him again soon. Although something tells me that we'll be waiting a while to get a less pessimistic point of view. It's usually at this stage that I suggest that you hit subscribe to make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming interviews. But we have another reason why you should add us to your subscription list, and that is our new show, The M3 Report. It too has market-leading interviews, but also brings you further commentary from the Gold Core team, chart analysis from the brilliant Garrett Soloway, and bonus material with this week's guest, Mark Faber. It's live now, so you can go and watch that next. And you can find a link in the description below. But for now, I've been your host, Dave Russell, and until next time. Mm -hmm.